Hey everyone, welcome to this week's uh, reading with myself and PD Mac. And our apologies for last week. Uh, we just both had things going on, and we could not get uh, get together to do the video. So uh, sorry about that. But we are back this week, so we are picking up with eleven and twelve where we left off, and we will just jump right into it. Uh, <clears throat> Chapter 11, Gwen. The figure exploded into motion. He lifted the sword in an overhead chop, bringing the blade down toward Gwen. She rolled aside at the last second and scrambled to her feet, rushing to the other side of the tent. The assassin came after her, wildly swinging his blade, the sword smashing into everything around him. Gwen turned to face him and summoned the magic of her speed runes. Luas, she spoke its name, then charged ahead, slamming into the assassin. They both went flying, crashing into the center pole of the tent. It splintered under the force, and the canvas collapsed on top of them. A cry of alarm echoed through the camp, followed by shouts and the sound of steel ringing upon steel. Gwen crawled under the material, trying to navigate her way to freedom. She heard the material rip, and then something heavy landed on her. It was the assassin. He pummeled her with his fist, striking her over and over. She stifled her groans of pain and blindly tried to grab onto him through the material. It was soft and she couldn't get a strong grip. Ladrich, she, gra she gasped, then pushed against him with everything she had. The weight was gone. She clawed at the canvas, and finally pulled it off, emerging to a site of chaos. Over a dozen tents were burning. Robed figures, more of Grimar's lackeys, were cutting their way through her army, headed for Lyra. She transformed into her dragon form and roared as she stomped the ground in anger. Gwen spotted Kalen. He was gathering a group of people, those who tried to flee and bringing them together. The assassin he'd attacked, who'd attacked her was back. She had no idea how far she'd flung him, but he appeared, he, uh, sorry, he approached calmly. Clearly, he, she hadn't injured him. He spun his sword around with skillful comfort and threw his head, hood back. He was much taller than her, and atop his head, where hair should have been, the skin was covered with runes. You made a grave mistake in coming here, he said. Gwen didn't bother with the reply. She lifted her hand and spoke the name of the lightning rune. A lance of blinding white energy left her palm, forking through the air. In the blink of an eye, the assassin twirled his blade and deflected the bolt into the sky. Gwen watched in amazement as the lightning flew high and disappeared. Is that the best you got? He mocked. He stalked around her in a circle, continuously spinning, spinning his blade, alternating from hand to hand. Your master was too frightened to come himself, Gwen said. The man laughed. Hardly. Dealing with someone as pathetic as you would be overkill. So why would Grimmar trouble himself? Gwen launched another lightning bolt at him as a distraction, then used her speed runes to close the distance between them. Her might rune invigorated her, and she punched him hard in the chest. She felt his bones crack under the blow, but she didn't stop. As the assassin fell backward to the ground, Gwen followed through with a wave of fire. His robes were incinerated instantly, trails of smoke wafting up from his charred remains. Gwen stood there, heaving in deep breaths. She was getting better at cohesively using the runes, but it drained her strength considerably. A look around the camp revealed that more tents were burning now. Kaelin's small group had doubled in size, and they were working to put out the fires. They were roared again, but the tone was different. It sounded pained. Gwen scanned the darkness and spotted the dragon. She was surrounded. A host of robed figures were encircled around her, but there were other people too. They were oddly clothed with glowing runes on their arms, and one of them jabbed a spear at Lyra. Gwen expected it to shatter as it struck her scales, but instead, the tip of the weapon pierced her chest. Gwen cursed and ran for her. Kaelin called out to her, but she ignored him. As she neared Lyra, she saw a pile of dead bodies on the ground. One was holding a sword, and she snatched it up, then drove it into the nearest mage. It was a woman. She crumpled to the ground with a bloody gurgle. The others turned to face her and drew their swords. Gwen jerked the blade free of the dead mage and held it up before her, having no idea how to wield it. Blood dripped down the blade and onto her hands. She'd rushed to aid Lyra, but now she was second-guessing her decision. She was outnumbered, one mage against a dozen or more. There! Gwen looked over her shoulder to see Kaelin. He pointed, and his group of fighters swarmed toward the enemy. The mages turned their attention away from her, and she rushed toward the people attacking Lyra. She targeted the one with the spear first, swinging her sword at him in an awkward motion. The man brought his spear up to block her strike, and the sword collided with the thick wood, sending powerful vibrations into Gwen's arms. 
Somehow, the blade hadn't carved through the spear. Gwen's hand, hands trembled violently, and she dropped the sword. What was she doing? She wasn't a warrior. She grabbed onto the spear. Time, she shouted. The spear caught fire. A man howled as the flames licked at his fingers, and he tossed the spear, the spear aside. Gwen grabbed him by the throat and looked him in the eyes. Drain Xiao. The man's eyes bulged as his life root was sucked away. Gwen drained him quickly and dropped the lifeless husk to the ground. The rune wanted more, demanded more. Gwen turned to meet the charge of another man. This one had no weapon, but he came at her anyway, his eyes filled with madness. She used her might rune to snap his neck, ignoring the yearning that the life rune pulsed through, pulsed through her. The ground rumbled ominously beneath Gwen's feet. One of the mages had cast a spell similar to the one Emil had in Westpen, and the ground heaved upward as it split open, swallowing several of Kaelin's men. Gwyn struck the mage with a lightning bolt. He was too focused on his own spell to defend himself, and his sizzling corpse sailed through the air before tumbling along the ground and skidding to a stop. Gwyn spun around looking for the next enemy, but Kaelin's men had subdued or killed those that remained. Lyra was on the ground, a pool of blood soaking the dirt around her. Gwyn rushed over and knelt beside her head. Venya? Can you hear me? The dragon's eyes were half open. Her chest rose and fell as she breathed, but the blood continued to seep from the wound caused by the spear. I'm fading, Fenya said. The dragon hunters have poisoned my body. How I feel it burning through me even now. Can you hear yourself? Gwen felt anxiety rising within her. It had been a while since she'd experienced the feeling. Just as when Tobias had died, she felt helpless. I tried, Fenya murmured. You can't die, Gwen said. We need you, and we're so close. We're here at his gates. Gwen pleaded with her, but Vinya's eyes started to lose focus and her wounds stopped bleeding. No, Gwen whispered sadly, stroking her hand along the scales of Vinya's face. The magic was tugging at her, but she tried to ignore it. She knew the dark rune, wanted to steal more life, and she refused to answer its call. The magic grew more insistent, to the point that it was starting to give her a headache. Gwen closed her eyes, intending to focus on the magic long enough to shut it out of her mind. And then she realized it wasn't the dark rune that was calling to her. It was the life rune she'd received from the elf in Olivelle. She remembered what the elf had done, restoring the vitality of a vine, and she opened her eyes. Perhaps she wasn't too late. She laid her hands on Venya's face. Sail. Energy flowed forth from Gwen into Venya. The dragon was like a dark well, and the energy vanished as it reached her. Gwen refused to give up, sending more and more energy into the darkness. She was already drained, and the river flowing out of her was exhausting what she had left. Gwen could feel her eyes closing. She fought to keep them open, to stay alert, but the darkness was so inviting. She startled, one of her hands slipping on Venya. Several blinks seemed to help at first, and she replaced her hand on Venya's snout. There was no air coming in or out. Instead of feeling panicked, Gwen was content. As her vision faded, the last thing she saw was a, green, a faint light beginning to glow at the bottom of the well. When Gwen regained consciousness, it was dawn. She was lying on the ground under the open sky, a thin blanket draped over her. Sitting up, she saw Lyra was gone. A few guards were keeping watch, but the rest of the camp was silent. Nearby, Kaelin lay sprawled out on his stomach, snoring loudly. The events of the previous night were a blur in her mind, and she remembered enough to piece together the fact that Grimmar had sent assassins after her and Lyra. Gwen rolled her head around, stretching her neck. She'd slept on rock, and now her neck was sore. She flung the blanket off and stood up, rubbing the sleep from her eyes. Kalen, she called out. He continued snoring, so she walked over and kicked his boot. His eyes snapped open and his body tensed, but when he saw it was her, he relaxed and offered a tired smile. I wondered if you'd ever wake up, he said, rolling over onto his back. He lifted his head and shielded his face against the morning glare. You stayed out here the whole time, Gwen asked. Someone had to keep an eye on you. You were asleep. I literally just closed my eyes. Kalen stifled a yawn and got up, brushing his clothes off. You expect me to believe that? You were snoring like a hog. Fine, fine. Maybe my eyes were closed for a little while, but the camp was in good hands. Besides, we both needed the rest. The gods only know what Torian's going to throw at us today. What? You didn't like his welcome party? Gwen rolled her eyes. They almost killed Venya. Okay, Kaylin grew somber. I know. She left a few hours ago. She said she was hungry enough to eat an entire field of cows. I'm just glad she's all right. That's thanks to you. You healed her. Fragmented memories floated above the haze, and Gwen nodded slowly. I remember. Sort of. They tried to kill you, but they also tried to scare off our army. It didn't work. Nobody fled? Well, I wouldn't say that. There were a handful of deserters. I can't fault them, Gwen said. These people aren't ready for what they will see today. A runner arrived and bowed low to Gwen, then looked at Kalen. Sir, 
has just arrived. He handed over a folded parchment. Kaylin opened it and read the contents. Torian is demanding we hand you over, he said, looking up at her. He'll grant a pardon for everyone who marched here if we do. Gwen made a noise in her throat. He's a fool if he thinks that, that it, will that, it will be that easy. Gwen stared at the castle, eyeing the walls and trying to determine the best plan of attack. Wake the mages. Tell them to report to me as soon as they've had breakfast. Kaylin looked at the runner. Do as she says. Yes, sir. The runner sprinted away. What's the plan? Kaylin asked. To bring hell to Dorian's doorstep. Chapter 12. Connell. <clears throat> to Connell's good fortune, the army approaching from the south was two regiments from Clagmoran's home guard, commanded by a thick necked bulldog of a man named Austin, who barged into where Connell and the others stood outside the gates of the city demanding, which one of you is Connell? That would be Lord Connell, Lorcan not so politely corrected him. Oh, uh, huh, never said anything about that. My apologies, my lord, Austin said, glancing around to see which one was the lord. Apology accepted, Connell replied with a tired smile. Expecting to see an older man, Austin cocked his eyebrow in surprise. Uh, Lord Kilmarin says this is, sends his respects, wishing you could send more, but the security of the kingdom is equally important. I am thankful to Lord Kilmarin, who was able to spare so many. He curved a hand at Story and Lorcan. General Lorcan and General Story are my primary commanders, along with Commander Sorsha. You will command your soldiers as the fourth division of this army. Coordinate as you see fit. We leave in the morning. Yes, my lord. He smiled with contented excitement. War council in 20 minutes. Be there. Yes, my lord. Uh, where? Connor kind of glanced up at the too close city. The ghost of the innocent dead seeming to hover at the open gates. Looking back over his shoulder at the charred remains of the battlefield, he smelled the acrid stench of burned bodies, wood, then turn back to Story. How about we meet at your tent? As you wish, my lord, Story replied, pleased with his specific attention. I'll meet you there then, Connell said. But first I need to talk to Drewston and Mynir. Madeline and Corla, I also want you two to stay. Recognizing the tone of dismissal, the commander slipped away to coordinate boundaries and liaison officers. Connell turned a sharp eye to Corla. Don't ever go off on your own again. What you did was stupid. I told you to stay with Madeline, and that is where you will stay from now on. Understood? I was only trying to help, she said, embarrassedly chastised in front of the others, especially Madeline. You can help by being where you're supposed to be. Had I needed maid support, no one knew where you were. Colonel then turned his attention to the two druids. I hope you know what you're doing, he fussed at them. While I appreciated the attack at Hapgan's army, you put yourselves in danger. Was that smart? It was expedient, Mynir answered. Taking the battle to Hapgan on your own would have been taking too much time. Yes, you could have won, you would have won, but at what cost? You now have your army intact, ready to go. Suppose some errant arrow found, it like, found you like it did Briok, he pointedly stated. We have greater protections as dragons than humans. Wait, what? Corla startled, her embarrassment forgotten. You're dragons? Madeline shook her head with paternal patience. Yes, dearie, they're shapeshifters. You're a mage. You should know about that. I do. I mean, I read about them, but I've never seen one in real life. She stared at them with fascination. Let's save it for later, Connell and Jelly scolded before turning back to the true druids. I'm not happy about you two in battle. I can still use your talents, specifically in scouting ahead. You can range farther and faster than any of my scouts. We can do that. Drewston acknowledged with a nod. Connell regarded them a moment longer. Are there any more coming? They're on their way, Minor answered. Hopefully, they should be here the next couple of days. Nodding thoughtfully, Connell said, Would you mind doing a sweep once more before you turn in for night? No problem, Drewston replied. We'll wake you if you need to. As the two druids drifted away into the night, Connell turned to the two mages, shifting a pointed finger at them. I have a feeling that once we get to Isenthal proper, you two will be very busy. He narrowed his gaze at Corla. When was the last time you talked to your brother? Just a little bit ago. Gwyn has taken Westpin. She has about 2,000 followers with her, mostly civilians. They're on the move to Havengard. 2,000? 
Kyle sputtered. How is she going to attack Havengard with 2,000? He began pacing. This is madness. She'll be destroyed. We've got to hurry. She says she has some more mages from the library with her. I don't know what that means, Connell brooded. We've got to move. Madeline placed a hand on his arm. It means she has some very powerful magic with her to make up for the lack of a real army. In this instance, their magic will more than offset the weakness of her army. Unconvinced, Connell shook his head. That may be all well and good, but we got to get to Havengard before Torin can throw all of his effort at her. We need to make some noise to draw off as much of his attention and force as possible. He abruptly spun around and headed off to the story's tent. Well, that was rude, Carla huffed. Madeline glanced up at her with a look of pity. Now is not the time to sugarcoat things, dearie. You got your own things all twisted and can't figure out why he's not goo goo eyes over you. All you have to worry about is yourself. She swept a hand of the vast array of campfires and activity. He's responsible for all of this. He's the future king. You, like you said, you're just a mage. Connell burst into stories, makeshift tent, a tarp raised up with a couple of poles. We got to move. Gwen's attacking Havagar with 2,000 civilians, probably armed with pitchforks and brooms. What? Story exclaimed, she's crazy. I know, but we're gonna have to get going. March the night, you dwarves, but you can't match strategy with man. You can march farther without rest. You can go days on end. That's one of the many things I admire about corpse. You're strong. That we are, my lord, Story replied, flattered. A word of advice? Please, let everyone rest for now. Give them a couple hours sleep now, and they'll be stronger later. We forced March to get here. A few hours rest now will save us time later. Torn between rushing off or listening to the wisdom of a soldier, he opted for wisdom. Besides, he was tired himself. What good would it do to exhaust everyone? A few hours nap would rejuvenate them all. I defer to your wisdom, my friend. Cancel the planning meeting tonight. We can do it on the morning while we're traveling. Smart move, Story grinned. We can move out in a couple hours before dawn. That'll give us plenty of time. Spread the word, Connell agreed. Sending several of his bodyguards to, to deliver the message, he headed back to his own tent. As he strode back, soldiers seeing him pass by called out greetings and he felt their confidence in him. Let's pray I don't let him down. Vito had a small pup tent set up for him with a bedroll unfurled inside. Get some sleep, Vito, he yawned. We'll be getting up early. Yes, my lord. Vito waited for Connell to stretch out in the bedroll before wrapping a thick woolen blanket around his shoulders. Settling onto the ground in front of Connell's tent, he curled an arm under his head and closed his eyes. Though tired, Connell's mind wouldn't settle and he tossed. He was sure that he had just fallen asleep when he felt the nudge and heard Vito's voice, Time to rise, my lord. Connell sat up and rubbed his eyes. Crawling out of the tent, he heard the rustle of activity as fires were doused, bedrolls tied up, tents dismantled. Yawning, he shivered in the morning briskness, silently wishing for something hot to drink. Numbly standing there, watching Beto turn down his tent, he felt someone behind him and turned to see Drewston and Miner approaching. Anything? Connell asked. It's quiet all the way to Gwynbrower. Drewston replied. How far is that? About halfway to Havengard, Mynir replied. Connell frowned. Seems too quiet. Should there be some sort of military presence between here and Havengard? You forget that you've destroyed two of Torian's armies, Drewston pointed out. Unless he knows his back door is open, he'll assume everything is fine. Connell's frown remained. He has to have some sort of communication with his military in the West. How is he doing it? That's something you need to ask your mages, Miner replied. She shifted a look at Drewston. Let's find a place to rest. Drewston nodded then told Connell, we'll catch up with you. I doubt we'll have a difficult time finding you. Be careful, Connell warned, suddenly feeling protective. We will, Drewston replied with a warm but tired smile. Lorcan passed the true druids, giving them a nod of friendship and came up to Connell. With your permission, I'd like to send out scouts well in advance of our forces. Do what you think best, my friend, Connell said, finally waking up. By the way, Jerusalem and Minders say so quiet all the way to Quinbriar. Lorcan's initial reaction was to ask how they knew, choosing to keep his own counsel, he said. 
That should help us move quicker. I've chosen several scouts to know the area and can walk into towns along the way without drawing suspicion. I like it, Connell nodded, immediately understanding. I want to place the mages farther forward. It's been too easy so far and I don't like it. Something's not right. Connell shook his head in misgiving. I have this feeling like we're being watched from afar. I can place them with my forward elements if you wish. That way they'll be far enough forward and stop protection. Kind of amused for a moment. What's the chance of us gaining more bodies as we march through Isenthal? There has to be more people like you willing to take a stand. We'll see as we get close to Havengard, my lord. Connell nodded. I guess we will. Are we ready? Yes, my lord. Let's move. We'll do a war council wherever you are. Once I track down the mages, I'll send them to you. Momentary left alone, Connell glanced around the darkness, hearing the muted commands and movements of bodies to places in order of march. The fact that he was in charge sobered him, and he was mindful of all the wisdom of his father, his real father, the one in Irve, who had chosen to love him like a real son, had preached at him. In this moment, he wished he had his father by his side, for the man always seemed to have the right answer, and he would know what to do and how to do it. Connell chuckled, remembering a dictum his father would often say, when working toward a solution to a problem, it always helps if you know the answer. His musings were interrupted when Madeline walked up with a half still asleep, with a half still asleep, totally in control. It's too quiet, my young lord, Madeline said. When I was in Blazington, I could feel Torian's presence. Not his exactly, but his wizard work, if, if you know what I mean. It was like a thick, foggy morning where the mist is so heavy it clings to you. I felt it here for a bit, but now it's gone. It's like his eyes turned somewhere else. Connell immediately thought of Gwen and locked a gaze on Corla. Have you heard from your brother? Not since the last message I gave you. Be careful, young lord, Madeline interrupted, placing a hand on Connell's arm. My messages can be intercepted, especially by them that knows it's happening. I'm not saying you don't need to know what's going on. I'm just saying it might be best to leave well enough alone. If he's occupied somewhere else, all the better for you. Sound wisdom, Madeline, he nodded, suddenly worried that all the previous chats the winds had might have been compromised, which might mean that he's being lured into a false sense of confidence. I want you two up with Lorcan's forces. He'll position you where I want. I need all the advance warning we can get. Madeline smiled in understanding and turned to Corlett. Come along, dearie. Let's see what mischief I can keep you out of. What are you talking about? Corlett grumbled as they walked away. Despite Connell's misgivings, the combined armies made excellent time arriving at Quinboire in the late afternoon. All the stress of scout reports, overhead searches for messenger birds, and frequent checks at Madeline revealed nothing out of the ordinary. The several towns they passed through, alarmed that the soldiers were hesitant about providing out supplies or information. Connell was angry at first until a story pointed out they don't expect us to win. He can't blame them. They've been living under Torian Sun for so long that they no longer have hope. And they're not about to get their hopes up because some stranger shows up claiming he's going to defeat Torian. Nothing will change until Torian is truly gone. You are right, Connell acknowledged with a sign, as usual. We rest here. More counsel in your tent an hour. Before Story had a chance to reply, Corley came racing up. Torian knows we're here. What? And Connell explained how. Corley leveled and I knew it all along, Adam. Look at him. Madeline. She's been working for Torian since the beginning. <laughs> All right, that's it for this week. So uh, we will, uh, assuming everything goes according to plan, be doing these like normal on, on a weekly basis. So, <clears throat> uh, so thank you for listening and we will see you next week. <laughs>